Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I am your host, Stephen Peinecker, and I'm very excited about this episode. But before we get started, just a reminder, this month's book giveaway is Witnessing Miracles by Josh Gailey, Historical Evidence for the Resurrection and the Book of Mormon. Josh, of course, is an evangelist with the Church of Jesus Christ, the Bicker Tonight organization, and uh, he wrote this great book that uses all the apologetics that evangelicals use to defend the uh, resurrection. He actually takes the very same arguments and shows that you can actually make a stronger case for the plates. And so that's this month's book drawing. Just remember, I'll have my email in the description. And when you send me the email, make sure you have in the subject line, June book drawing, and give me your full name and address in the email, US residents only. Sorry, KC, I know you're in South Korea. I can't get it to you. Sorry. All right, folks, uh, I'm very excited because the Joseph Smith Papers Project, you know, it seemed like this is just gonna go on forever, but it's winding down, folks. And I talked with Robin a couple weeks ago and asked him, hey, why don't you come on, get some some people that have been involved in this project, and let's kind of do a retrospective on the Joseph Smith Papers. Now, this is one of my most favorite items in my collection. When I had Robin on to talk about this edition, the Revelations and Translations edition, which has the, uh, uh, the photos of the original uh, manuscript of the Book of Mormon, I call it, these are the Mormon Dead Sea Scrolls here, folks. It's really awesome. And so I love, I love this volume been a real important uh, thing in my collection. And the Joseph Smith Papers Project, man, let me tell you, I I remember watching the uh, documentaries that they put out. I think Larry Miller's group put that out and uh, about the history uh, of it. And I remember like six, seven years ago watching them and just being entranced by the whole Joseph Smith Papers Project. So I've been following it very closely. And what a great, wonderful thing that this has done. What a great story, too. But before we get there, let's introduce my uh, guest here. Robin Jensen, uh, you're the homie that put this together for me. I appreciate you coming on. Welcome to the show today. Thank you very much. And so I have new two new people that I've just recently met. Now, Sherilyn, I met you uh, at the Mormon History Association. Uh, Sherilyn Howcraft, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Stephen. And did I pronounce your name correctly? Sherilyn, Yes. Carolyn Cowcraft, very good, because I, I I have a last name, Pinecker, and that gets easily butchered as well. And uh, so you, you're you with the Joseph Smith Papers Project. And Eric Smith, welcome to the program. We just met. Great to meet you and uh, look forward to our chat. So basically, uh, Robin, I just want to kind of maybe just give me some of your perspective. Now, tell me how long you've been involved with the project and kind of the role that you've played with it. And maybe just talk about yourself a little bit, too. Yeah, so uh, I was a BYU student. Um, uh, this was when uh, they were offering master uh, degrees uh, in history. Uh, so I was a master's student, and I, like any student, was looking for a job. Um, and I got a job as a research assistant for Ron Walker. He was then working on his Mountain Meadows Massacre book. And this was at the Joseph Fielding Smith Institute for Latter Latter-day Saint History. And this was the same institute that was doing the Joseph Smith papers at the time. And I was, of course, aware of the Joseph Smith papers. I was kind of enviously looking into their office, wondering what was going on. Well, uh, long story short, funding uh, dried up for some and opened up for others. And I was hired on as a research assistant for the Joseph Smith papers. This was about 2004. So it's almost been um, 20 years for me working for the Joseph Smith papers. Um, Although technically I was working for a professor who was working on the Joseph Smith paper. So I, I counted as 20 years. Um, it, maybe I'm fudging the numbers a bit. But um, so I started uh, early on in the project when it was down at BYU. Um, there's been a long history of the Joseph Smith papers and, and how we've done things. Eventually in 2005, it moved from BYU up to the uh, Church History Library. Um, and we've been there ever since. And I've been there ever since. And it's like Christmas morning every day working for the Joe Smith papers. There's always new discoveries and fun things to to work on. You know, it is fascinating. I, I, I am curious, what was the uh, reasoning behind moving it from BYU to the church history uh, department? There were a number of factors that went into it. I think the the biggest reason for me at the time was that it, it allowed us for uh, closer access to the document. So a documentary editing project is one where we are featuring the documents. We're trying to publish the, the transcriptions of the documents. And that means that we're, uh, checking and rechecking and triple checking the transcriptions to make sure that they're accurate. Um, and part of that process means viewing the original manuscripts, describing them, giving them physical descriptions uh, in addition to historical and archival con uh, uh, context. And so 
being close to the documents was a, a real blessing for us and crucial, I think, in, in completing the Joseph Smith papers. Okay, so Sherilyn, I want you to talk a little bit about your role that you've played and talk a little bit about your background and how long you've been with the with the project. Sure, so I started, um, I became an employee of the church history department in uh, September of 2000. At that time, I was working on uh, the teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith curriculum manual, gathering sources for that. In uh, January of 2001, I started serving as a church archives liaison uh, for uh, the papers of Joseph Smith that was down at uh, BYU's uh, Joseph Fielding Smith Institute for Latter-day Saint History. And um, basically, I was representing the interest of the church archives, which included um, assessing, uh, together with the historians at the Smith Institute, assessing the records that they needed access to, as well as um, currying CDs uh, from church archives down to the Smith Institute, and also having conversations about some of these broader uh, issues uh, relating to access um, and uh, working on um, uh, continuing the work that Dean Jesse did in his uh, control file of Joseph Smith documents, which he had begun in the 19, I believe the early 1970s, possibly the 1960s. And so I was basically augmenting that, the, that material with materials we had here and uh, working on the beginnings of what became the Joseph Smith Papers control file as some of the digital component of that and um, getting that data uh, fixed so it could be used and uh, understood by our historians in, um, in ways that would uh, benefit their work. Um, I've, in, in the course of that work on the Joseph Smith Papers, I've gone from gathering uh, documents to doing uh, research on custodial history and provenance of these documents, as well as uh, handwriting ID for um, a, a majority of the records. So that is really uh, great that to be so heavily involved in the process like that. It just it must have been, I mean, just just on a personal level, what was it like to be so intimately involved in 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 this whole process? I mean, imagine, and also maybe talk about how even how it may have even had a role with your faith journey as well. Um. So I, uh, when I started work on the Joseph Smith papers, um, I this this is not you know documentary editing history in archives was not my profession. I mean, I was I was very young. I was in my mid twenties. Um, I had. Um, I, I had a degree in English with an African-American lit emphasis. I also had a Hebrew minor. I had, I had been to the BYU Jerusalem Center um, and uh, was actually among the first cohort of students that were doing an intensive Hebrew program there. And then I came back and paid off my student debts and I came down here and it was, it was really kind of a, um, I, I stumbled on this and, and it was, it was really in, in its onset, it was very overwhelming to me because I was surrounded by these people who had who had selected history as their profession and archives as their profession. And I was blown away by their intelligence and their carefulness and their um, their um, their excitement about about uh, latter day saint history. And so, for me, it was, you could say that my my understanding of Latter-day Saint history was very much like your lay church member. And so going from that sense of lay church member knowledge to becoming an expert on the records and seeing the records and, you know, having my fingerprints all over these things and, and really coming to terms with them uh, on their on their own. Um, I have to admit, you know, when I when I first started out, I was really quite shocked at what I was seeing, not because anything that I was seeing was really startling on its face, but rather because the material that I had been encountering in seminaries and institutes was markedly different from what I was encountering in the records themselves, because the records themselves, you did have the sense of of people at, at all levels of interaction with their faith, everything from people that who were extremely faithful to people who were having faith crises, to people who were who were uh, dissenters and very antagonistic towards the faith. 
And I hadn't seen that spectrum in my, in my work with the seminaries and institutes. And so in this process of just learning about, about the materials, I really just started on, I, I basically scrapped everything that I had learned in seminaries and institutes and said, that model is not going to work for me here. And so I started looking at the records themselves, pouring over the records. And I was doing this day in and day out as part of this gathering the records for the Joseph Smith papers. I was confronting the voices of the people who had experienced this. And so I dug in, I started reading them, their accounts. I started taking them on their own terms without a crafting of a historical narrative. They were the voices that I was confronting and it was much more, in the process of that work, I found it much more compelling, much more um, motivating to me than anything that I had read in my seminaries and institutes class. And in that process of getting to know not only my coworkers, but starting at this foundational level of gathering these records, it was, it was this enormous undertaking. And I have to say, in, in, in its onset, we had this perception of what we thought we knew. And then we started to get into the thick of it, getting into the weeds, getting into the trees, really, um, really assessing these records and their contents. And there was this realization that all these, all of our expectations, or I should say our initial expectations of how we would go about these records can uh, significantly shifted as we continued to work through the records. And as we continued to have conversations about things as simple as, what is a Joseph Smith document? And really going through the records and the organizational records that were being created and figuring out how are we going to represent these records in our letterpress volumes and, and also kind of uh, marking the trajectory of the records. We've got a lot of revelations on the onset, a lot of minutes, but that continues to evolve. The more Joseph Smith gets clerks involved, uh, the more, um, the history writing initiative uh, uh, gains traction and it just it evolves in in the process of joseph smith's lifetime wow fascinating yeah i, I always tell people the the non-correlated history of the church is uh, absolutely fascinating and that's kind of what this channel's become is i've had fairly prominent um, members of the church come to me and say that they're learning about the history of their church by watching this channel which is, i think is so fascinating to to be able to really uh, help tell this story I love what's happened over the course of the last 20 years with the church, with the Joseph Smith Papers Project. And now we got the Saints volumes being published that we're now kind of getting a, a greater exposure to the fuller picture of the restoration, which to me is a phenomenal story. It's, as an outsider, I am just enthralled by it. That's what got me doing this channel was just the great history. It's so wonderful. And 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 it's not a boring history. It's far from that. And it's uh, it's just great to, to you're able to see these people on these writings and things that come alive. You know, when you're able to engage the original source documents, and it just must be so exciting to be able to do stuff like that. Eric, let's get you in on this conversation, dude. Tell me about your experiences and your involvement in this whole project as well. Well, it's interesting. I've My office is right by Sherilyn's at work, but just listening to her talk, I just learned several things about her that I didn't know. And one is that she, I didn't know she had started working for the church in September 2000, but that's that's when I started working for the church, but I was in a different department. I started in the curriculum department. Be my background was in, in editing. I, I actually have a law degree and I had been a lawyer for a couple of years. So I started working for the church in 2000 and I was really early on assigned to support presence of the church, Joseph Smith. You'll remember and a lot of the listeners that the church um, had a teachings of presidents of the church series for a long time that we studied in our Sunday um, meetings. And so I was working on the one about Joseph Smith. And uh, there was a, a historian archivist named Ron Barney who worked in the archives with Sherilyn. And he was kind of our liaison to this curriculum project. So if we had a question about, hey, uh, can you tell us more about where this document came from? Or in, in the teachings volume, we don't just have what Joseph Smith said. We have some historical information to kind of introduce themes in, in, in his teachings. So for those, we relied a lot on Ron to provide us, to, to check our information, provide us sources. And so over time he would say, oh, let me check with the Joseph Smith papers people on that. And I had no idea what that was. And then he'd say, at some point I heard the, the name Dean Jesse. I'm like, oh, this must be a, 
important person. <laughs> and so then I personally got Dean's books that had been published by then, Personal Writings and his two volumes of the uh, papers of Joseph Smith. And I started to use those as I was in the curriculum department. And kind of like Sherilyn was talking about, I was just a lay person. Um, my background was in English literature and law, and I hadn't studied church history too thoroughly. And I was just fascinated by Dean's approach, this documentary, documentary editing approach. In 2005, when Bushman's biography came out on Joe Smith, I just, you know, read it in two weeks. I thought, I can't, this is amazing. How can I get more of this stuff? So as um, <laughs> I just learned more and more about the Joseph Smith papers. And then, and I didn't realize it had it moved from BYU. I mean, at that time, I didn't realize it was at BYU and it moved up to the church. In 2006, my work on that curriculum manual kind of started to, to die down. And they, the Joe Smith papers, Ron Asplund actually asked, hey, do you want to help be an editor on our project? Meaning to help with the publishing thing. Because they had most of the people working on the project, of course, were historians. They were writing the books and all this kind of thing. But they didn't have a plan for how they're going to actually publish them. Who's going to edit them? Books have to be typeset, all this kind of thing. So I was a uh, long story, but basically the first uh, editor to, to work for the project after it moved up to Salt Lake. There had been a couple down in Provo, but they they decided to go on with you know other plans or whatever. So something cool that I was able to be part of was basically building up our editing and publishing team. And we now have, well, in the height of the Joe Smith papers, not now, but we had as many as about 18 or 20 full-time editors, which is just incredible. These, so these are people um, checking the sources. Um, every source gets checked by another person, by a source checker. We call that reference editing. Um, we do substantive editing. We do the copy editing, proofreading. We do all the work. We actually lay out all the books ourselves. Um, we contract with the indexer. We find the images. We clear them through intellectual property and all that kind of thing. So all the work that a publisher would do, we do all that. Other than Desert Book uh, uh, arranges the um, with the printer and Desert Book actually pays for the, the publishing costs. So they, they take care of that and the distribution. But we do all the actual work of preparing the, the files and all that kind of thing. Anyway, so my background, like I said, is in editing. So I just love words. I've always loved history. And I, I don't know if I've said it was Christmas every morning, but it was like that. When, um, <laughs> when Ron Esplin asked me to work on the Joe Smith papers, I was going around the halls telling people like, this is and calling my wife and everything it was like I can't believe this is happening and I didn't I I didn't know what it meant kind of like Sherilyn was saying I didn't know what is this project how long is it going to go on who are all these people I just knew I had like been reading some of Dean's work and I was just fascinated with it and was really thrilled to be a part of it so Robin you know one of the one of the bigger surprises of this whole thing is this essentially this was meant to basically just be libraries would be purchasing these and putting these in their collections but there's actually a lot of lay people that are also buying these as well and having them added into their personal collection was that a surprise to you guys when that when that first started happening um yes and no uh we've 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 thrown around the name dean jesse quite a bit dean was a scholar is a scholar of joseph smith brigham young uh of documents he published um, several works of documentary editing. He published the papers of Joseph Smith and he published a volume of personal writings of Joseph Smith. And this was sold, you know, in Desert Book. This was bought by church members. So we knew going in that um, while we were creating a reference work, we also knew that there would be some interested Latter-day Saints that would buy these books. But I think initially we were blown away by how many people purchased them. So our first volume was the first volume of the journal series. Um, and that was published in 2008, I believe. And um, we were we were blown away with how many people bought bought this book. Um, the, the number was staggering with with how many was buying it. And this is, you know, we were comparing ourselves to the papers of Thomas Jefferson or the papers of George Washington or Benjamin Franklin, some of these other documentary editing projects that have a really low print run. You know, they a, a good print run for a scholarly documentary editing project is, you know, 1500. That That's a pretty good print run. And we were selling in the thousands, tens of thousands initially. Um, and so I think what happened is that 
some may have felt that the first couple volumes, maybe they had a misunderstanding. Maybe they thought that that was all of the Joseph Smith papers. They didn't realize what they were committing to, to buying a, you know, 25 plus volumes. Um, and so our numbers have uh, steadily decreased um, over the life of the projects, but we still sell a significant number of uh, volumes. And a lot of those, um, m maybe uh, half, maybe a little less than that are going to interested Latter-day Saints. A and I think that's a testament to, you know, Latter-day Saints are interested in their past. There, There is a connection to the faith uh, in which they live every day and the the connection to that past. And, you know, relatively speaking, 1820 or 1830 or whatever date you want to pick in Joseph Smith's lifetime wasn't that long ago. You know, we have documents that survive from that. And, you know, if, if we're talking about Islam or Christianity or Judaism, none of the founding documents for the origin of, of the religion still exist. And so uh, the church is in a unique position where we have these documents that have survived. We have an archive that keeps these documents. Um, and Latter-day Saints are interested in, in the past. They're interested in their past and learning about their past. Yeah, that is so true. Absolutely. And and uh, I think that's what makes it such a unique thing is that you do, like, for instance, in the Mormon History Association, the amount of amateurs, lay people that are presenting, you know, it, which it may adds to just, I think, adds to a certain dynamic to the whole thing, unlike a lot of other historical groups and stuff. Um, I want to know, you all said it was like Chris, almost like Christmas morning, every morning doing what you're doing. I want to know what was one of those moments. And I want each one of you to tell me one of those moments when you're doing this uh, research and you're engaging these documents just kind of made you like, whoa, like just in a, a maybe in a, maybe something that was thrilling to you, maybe something that maybe was even a spiritual thing to you. Let me just talk about one of those moments that you had that really and just it, 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 feel free, any one of you just to chime in on that, that that really in, maybe impacted you. Where do you even start on that? I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out like what what moment. Um, I, I don't know if this is the best one, but it's it's certainly um, the one you know one of them that I gravitate to. Um, there was a, a course of uh, documents that were transferred over from uh, the first presidency of of the uh, Latter Day Saint Church and. And uh, this was in 2009, and there was a series of records, and there's a, a, a lot of backstory there in terms of why why they had the materials and and, and that subsequent uh, turning of things over. But I remember going into one of my coworkers' office. She didn't say anything to me. She just handed me a document, and I looked at it, and there was no identifying signature. There was nothing like that, and I. Um, I looked down at it Ed, and I started reading it and I got three words into it and my eyes kind of bugged out because I realized it was Joseph Smith's handwriting. And I asked her, I'm like, where did this come from? <laughs> and it was the blessing uh, to Sarah Ann Whitney. And it was just, it was something that we had known about for years. We had a, a transcript, a typescript of it in the Joseph Smith collection here in the department but we had no sense of its context. We had no sense where it was coming from. We knew that the content of it was interesting and amazing, but uh, being uh, careful with our records, we're, not, we're a little reticent to use transcripts of things for which we have no idea where they're coming from. And so that had just kind of lain fallow for years. And, and to see the original there was just, a, it was a breath of fresh air. And to um, have that moment of recognition of handwriting, um, and 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 to read it, you know, just the sense of I'm reading this from his pen, from his own hand, where he's talking about sealing and the connection with priesthood, and it was just, it was one of those remarkable moments because, you know, there's so many times that a majority of the records that are considered Joseph Smith papers, a majority of them are not written in his hand, but then when you see those that are written in his hand. He's the one forming the words. He is the one putting them on paper. It's it's a really quite a remarkable moment. Wow, Eric, how about you? Uh, well, so like I said, I started working with the project in 2006, and pretty soon you learn about this thing called the Council of Fifty. And some people obviously knew quite a bit about it. Um, 
um, but uh, very few people had ever been able to see the uh, records. They were, of course, in the First Presidency's collection. I, do you guys remember the year now, Sherilyn and Robin? Was it 2012 or 2013 when we had that meeting where we got to see them and everything? It must have been 2013. Anyway, a meeting is called for the staff. It says, uh, come down to such and such conference room at one o'clock and there'll be a cool announcement. And we all go down there and the announcement is the Council of 50 Minutes have been transferred to our department and we have permission to publish them and we're gonna move forward to publish them as part of the Joseph Smith papers. And there they were in the room and you could look at them, you could pick it up in your hand and there are these small books William Clayton's handwriting, so it's very legible. And I just, we we knew that the um, if we couldn't get permission to publish the Council of 50 Minutes, it would be this, I don't know what you want to say, like this mark against the project. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have succeeded in being transparent and comprehensive with what we were trying to do. So to get that permission was just this amazing moment. And I, I because I'm just like a regular person, not, you know, I don't have a PhD or whatever. I'm like, I can't believe I'm one of the people that gets to be one of the first to see this. And we didn't, we we didn't have permission to to um, share that information until close to the time the book was published. So it was amazing for two or three years. The book was published in 2016. So for three years, and I was I was the the lead editor on it, meaning I was the head of the the editing group that supported the historians. I was able to look at those minutes all the time talk to the historians about what they were learning and just sitting there thinking, I, again, I can't believe I'm one of the first people that gets to read this and figure out and help figure out what it means. Yeah, that would be some, just so, because we have a largely lay audience here, maybe explain what it, what was the Council of 50 and the significance of you being able to publish it? Okay. Um, so the last few months of his life, Joseph Smith forms this organization it comes to be called the Council of 50 because it has about 50 people that are part of it. And almost all of them are church members. There's three who aren't members of the church. And it's a kind of a complicated story. But the basic idea is the church is thinking about moving out of Illinois. They're thinking about moving west. They look at Texas, um, other places. They consider moving to Oregon. And the idea is let's talk about the form of government that we want when we get there. So there's lots of talks about the Constitution of the United States, what's what's what the flaws of the Constitution might be. So some of these conversations are quite sensitive because the Latter-day Saints are already not doing very well with their neighbors and with the government. And so it'd be quite controversial that they were talking about leaving the United States, that they were criticizing the Constitution. So the minutes um, from the very beginning are, are kept confidential. The uh, There's a secrecy requirement of the people that uh, join the council. Um, but it ends up having a lot of real practical uh, what purposes at that time. One was um, it helps manage Joseph Smith's uh, campaign for the president. Uh, the Council of 50 does a tremendous amount of work of trying to figure out where the church is going to settle. They actually send Lucian Woodworth, one of their members, down to Texas. He talks to Sam Houston down there. Um, they send people back to Washington, D.C. to work with politicians to see if there's any options there. So they do quite a bit there. And then in Nauvoo, after the Nauvoo City Charter is revoked, this um, the the uh, Council 50 actually has a lot to do with the practical kind of government of Nauvoo for, for a little while. Um, a, a really cool thing that, that that we find in there is there's, there's things that Joseph Smith said that uh, we didn't know about before. He has a really powerful statement in there about religious liberty, just several paragraphs talking about, um, well, he has other really powerful teachings, as you know, about religious liberty, but there's one in there that's that's amazing. And so we have teachings we didn't know about. We have Brigham Young saying stuff in, in there that we didn't know about. So, and it's, it's a large record. It's um, hundreds of pages. You have, you know, William Clayton in there, Willard Richards, John Taylor, all kinds of key church leaders. Um, I, I don't know if I've been there. Anyway, uh, it, it, everybody knew it existed, and it's a Joseph Smith paper in the sense that he was in charge of that organization. He was the one that oversaw the creation of the minutes. He has sermons in there, so we just absolutely had to have access to that to be comprehensive in our work. So it was a big moment. I can imagine. So, Robin, just uh, that was a 
this long winded, but I wanted to get some good context there. So what was your biggest surprise? One of the big moments that you had while engaging this project? Uh, I have any number of examples I could give, but I'm going to give you kind of a taste of when I say that I find really interesting finds. Let me give you a taste of what that looks like, uh, because it's not always earth shattering. It's not always, um, you know, a big discovery like Eric talked about, but the implications of it are sometimes important. So I worked on Revelation and Translation Volume 4. This was the Book of Abraham and other related manuscripts. Um, this was an important volume uh, to get all of the, the, you know, the papyri and the Egyptian language documents and the Book of Abraham manuscripts. In that volume, there's, or, or rather, um, we have two early Kirtland era manuscripts of the Book of Abraham, uh, three, but two that I was look that I were the, that I was looking at. Um, these are important manuscripts because they're the earliest we have. They're, um, you know, in early clerk's handwriting. Um, and I had already spent countless hours on these manuscripts, both of them. Um, I had done the transcription verification. Uh, I had been analyzing them. I had I had tried to contextualize them. Well, after this countless hours, I was I had both of the original documents, um, and I remember because I was in a separate um, conference room because my office, my desk was um, not it, it was cluttered with things. I know my coworkers will find that shocking, but it, I didn't have enough room on my desk, so I had to find an empty conference room to lay out these pages just to kind of get a sense of of what they looked like. And as I had both of these documents there on the table, I noticed that there was uneven edges on some of the pages. And I put two, the first pages of both of these documents together and they fit. They were originally one sheet that were torn apart and then they were used for two different documents. And putting those two together was a discovery to me that had incredible implications. Um, you know, if you've got one sheet of paper and you cut it in half and then you have writing on it, the implication is that these were probably done at the same time or around the same time. Um, and, and, you know, there's some other other things that we can we, we can talk about there. But I, I think that is one of that's an example where I tell that to people and they're like, yeah, that's not really important. Uh, um, and yet. This is the kind of stuff that I live for. This is the kind of um, materiality of the text that I think is so important to convey because documents are not simply sources for historians. Documents are cultural artifacts. They are created in the time and place that they are created. And the people that are creating these documents have motivations and cultural baggage and all this stuff. And we can learn about that culture, that society, by understanding better how these documents are made. And so that's one kind of example of a of kind of a small discovery that I think to me is is quite significant. You know, I was just <clears throat> like this one says <clears throat> volume five, but yeah. this is not volume five of like this isn't the fifth volume. It's like a subsection. So maybe talk about how like this is part of the Revelations and Translations volume five. You refer to volume four being the book of Abraham. Talk a little bit about how things are kind of subdivided and what the thought process is and having these different, and, and, and maybe talk about some of the work that you were doing on that, like the, the fourth and fifth volumes as well. Yeah. So if, if we're talking about the Joseph Smith corpus, all of his records, um, there, there's a lot of ways to present that. You could do kind of a chronological setting where the very first document and the very last document and all the documents in between, that could be just one giant series or set of books. Um, that's a perfectly perfectly viable way of doing that. There's many papers projects that do that. Um, we decided um, early on that maybe there was a different way to present the papers, and we would break up the the papers of Joseph Smith by genre, essentially. And so we have different genres. We call them series of the Joseph Smith papers. And so, for instance, all of Joseph Smith's journals are part of a series. All of his historical writings are part of the history series. All of his revelations and translations are part of that series. We have a legal series. We have a business series. Um, and then we have an administrative uh, series. And then the biggest series is the document series. This is essentially the chronological telling of Joseph Smith paper. So it begins in um, 1828 and it ends on July 27th, uh, 1844 in the 15th volume of that document series. Um, now that's 
uh, as I say, that's not the only way we could have done that. There, there could have been all sorts of other ways of presenting Joseph Smith papers, but that's what we decided early on. And so when we talk about the Revelation and Translation series or the journal series, that's what we're talking about. And on, um, you know, we've published our final volume, Docs 15. That's kind of what we call it. But that what that means is that that's the 15th volume of the document series. Okay, and so that how so that will be the final one that will be coming out. Uh, this this episode will be airing right around June twenty seventh when uh, when when this will be the final release. So is that is that the day that it's the final volume is being released on June twenty seventh? Yeah, that's our that's our on shelf release date is June twenty seventh, and of course that's the uh, anniversary of the uh, martyrdom of Joseph Smith when he was killed in the uh, Carthage jail along with his brother Hiram. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and. Uh, Wow. Well, I, I just, that kind of begs the question here. Um, and any of you can chime in on this. What happens, like, is, is, are you guys open to the possibility of having addendums where let's say a new, some new documents come out that, uh, what, what would you, how would you guys be dealing with documents that, that would be coming out after your, with the completion of the series? Would you guys prevent, would you guys publish uh, additional volumes to this series? I'll just say a quick note and then Sherilyn will say something up. Uh intelligent to 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 actually clarify my answer but um even though the print books are going to be done on june 27th our website josephsmithpapers.org where all this stuff is available for for free it's not yet completed for example when we publish each print print volume about a year or a year and a half later we put all the contents of that print volume onto the website for free a lot of it's a lot of the content is already out up there because we have transcripts and images, but all the footnotes and introductions, they don't go up until later. So necessarily we can't even get those up until 2025 or so. We have some significant amounts of records in our administrative series, for example, that still need to be added. The financial series, which only got underway in earnest two or three years ago, still has a lot of documents that have to be published. So when we talk about finishing the project, we're really talking about finishing the print edition but the website isn't finished. And then of course the website will have to be maintained for forever. But I'll let Sherilyn answer the question about uh, what would we do if we found more documents? <laughs> so um, people should probably know that the letterpress volumes are about 10 to 12% of the, the corpus of, of records that we're dealing with. And so if they're looking for a comprehensive uh, look at Joseph Smith's life, the, the best option is the website. Um, and, and the content of the letterpress volumes will be published in its entirety on the website. But um, in addition to the, to the other uh, exhaustive material that will be hyperlinked to, to the material in the letterpress. Um, so back to your question about um, if we find more documents, well, we already have you know, in at the Mormon History Association, two of our historians were doing some research in uh, record centers in the area, and we found two additional Joseph Smith documents. So this this happens uh, fairly frequently, and um, our plan is to post those on the website. The one thing that's nice about a web environment is is it's very forgiving, and we can revise things as we need to. Uh, anytime that we have new material posted to the website, we um, alert the public to it in a newsletter. So if people haven't uh, signed up for our newsletter, I recommend that they do so. Anytime we have new content that we push to the website, we let our uh, our users know. So I wanted to say, Robin, I, I got I did, literally right before I started taping this interview, I just remembered that I received an email from somebody. His name's Michael. And he, he, one of the things he, uh, he was co just complimenting the channel and, the, and and everything like that. But he had mentioned that he was he was he was floored when he watched our interview. When I asked you in particular about the special clamshell that was made for the original documents, and apparently this Michael, he's the one that actually donated it to the church. And he, <clears throat> and I thought that's so cool too. Uh, so he says it's a long story, but that was a gift to the church archives from me sometime around back around two thousand seven ish. Um, I thought, wow, that's really cool uh, that that you because I remember watching that news report <clears throat> where they were <clears throat> talking about it and they had this really cool clamshell. Yep. And that as a as a fan, as a collector, and then to hear from people that hey, I was the one that donated that. That to me excites me. 
as well. And and so I don't know. I'm just genuinely excited about this whole project. And that that is a super cool uh, thing that they have with, with the documents. And by the way, let me ask you. If I ever get back out to Utah, which is fairly frequently, do you think there's any chance I could go and look at, at least look at the clamshell? I don't even have to look at the originals. <laughs> so uh, we do go, uh, we have a display at the Church History Library where uh, some of the original pages of the Book of Mormon are on display and whatnot. We 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 don't display the clamshell box. Um, I, I, you're one of the only people I know that wants to see the clamshell, but not the... the <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you'd be happy to just see the original manuscript, but uh, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll we'll have to see if we can arrange that. I, I can't promise anything, but uh, um, yeah, it, it's a it's a fun thing. And and one of the things I love about that email is it kind of it it kind of gets to the point of the Joseph Smith Papers. So we are about uh, we we want to publish these documents for a community, a community of scholars, a community of believers. You know that there is a community that has grown up in using reading the Joseph Smith Papers. Um, and that community can expand to more people as the books become more and more well known. But this this community, maybe I'm stretching this metaphor a little too thin, but the, the community also is um, there There are documents still out there uh, in people's basements and attics. attics. Uh, um, I mean, you have a growing audience. Maybe there's someone in your audience that knows of a location of a Joseph Smith papers. We, we want to expand this uh, corpus of Joseph Smith documents. We want to make the Joseph Smith Papers, the place for Joseph Smith scholarship. And we can only do that if we have people that are continually sending uh, leads to us. And just because we have published our final volume doesn't mean that we're not interested in updating the kind of our control file, our comprehensive list of Joseph Smith documents, our website. If they're, you know, no, no matter how slight, no matter how small, even if it's a you know, uh, a signature of Joseph Smith. We're we're interested in hearing about those, so please please send those along to us. Yeah, and that's the key thing. I actually want to ask because one of the one of the nice things about my channel is I talk to everybody, all the different branches within the restoration, and uh, so maybe talk talk a little bit about maybe the engagement of dealing like with the community of Christ and other church bodies that also have these documents. Maybe talk about how that the, you had to kind of negotiate that and, and maybe the relationships that you're able to forge with different restoration branches and in their collections. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and then Eric or Sherilyn can say more. Um, I've, I've developed good friendships with uh, members of the community of Christ uh, through the course of the Joseph Smith papers. They have bent over backwards in assisting uh, this work. Um, and they have been gracious with their records. Uh, they have been gracious with their time, um, their resources. They have really helped us in uh, sharing and and really kind of co-producing this Joseph Smith Papers project. We could not have done it without uh, efforts from Community of Christ and others. And, you know, we, we have a shared heritage. Uh, we, we both trace our beginnings to Joseph Smith. Um, they are as interested in their history as we are in our history. And it's, you know, it's it's the same history for quite some time. And so we, we are more than happy and, and pleased to to collaborate with them. And um, yeah, I, I consider some of them my good friends uh, there in the community of Christ. Eric, I wanted, I wanted to add something to what Robin has said. Um, we're, we're also, uh, you know, part of the work that we've been doing has been uh, on the, uh, you know, good graces of people who have some of these documents in private possession. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that have, um, you know, some of the Joseph Smith legal documents. I mean, people would be surprised at the, the, uh, the uh, number of people who have contributed records to our work. Everything from people who have found things in their attics, from their great, 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 great grandparents, um, to people who are avid collectors and sellers of Mormon manuscripts. And so it's just been wonderful as, as the project gained steam, as we, as we had uh, started to have a web presence and people started to see a tangible representation of what we were doing. It was just wonderful when people came forward and said, hey, I've got these records, are you interested in this? I mean, it's, it's really been a collaborative effort in, in so many ways and um, we, we, still want people to bring records forward. It's just been wonderful to have that collaboration. And we want that to continue uh, as we move forward. And and even though, as Robin said, our letterpress volumes are, are going to be complete, we still have a website. We still have records out there and we 
we uh, want we want those records to be a part of this work. I'll, I'll give you a little angle at, uh, going on. So Sherilyn was talking about how many people have contributed to this project just by contributing a document here, here and there. Here's, here's another example of that. In the, you know, 2007, somewhere in there, we were working on the first volume of the Revelations and Translation series. It has two manuscripts books in it. And the idea was we wanted to do a, a facsimile edition. We want to have photographs of these documents next to the transcript. Well, the question is, where, where are we going to get these photographs from? And this was, we could have done a, a scan or that kind of thing, but we wanted the highest quality we could get. And there was a man working for the church named Weldon Anderson who worked in the, like the, he would normally be taking photographs of, of temples or of church leaders, this kind of thing. And he was extremely interested so uh, in this. So we arranged where um, Robin or others that could be trusted would take the documents over to the photo studio and they'd be laid out on a table and Weldon took these incredibly high resolution photos of, of the book. And so if you're looking on our website or in any of our books and you see photo by Weldon Anderson, that's him. And he was so interested in it that over the years, um, getting back to the community of Christ um, uh, relationship, uh, we were able to arrange for him to go out to independence or to other places and sometimes for days and they would they would make a place where he could take photographs so he took he was the one that took the photographs of the uh printer's manuscript the book of mormon and it um it shows their hospitality and and their cooperation to allow a photographer to come out and then it's an example of someone who you wouldn't think of being a contributor someone who's a photographer but someone who because of their talents and just kind of their natural interest in this was able to make a big difference. Yeah, that reminds me, you know, I've had Brent Ashworth on my program numerous times and we do the show and tell segments where he he does a historical object in his collection. And I don't know what it is ahead of time. And then I have to think on my feet. But one of them was uh, one of his one of the original manuscripts. So to give you an idea, like if you have a collection, what Brent did was he brought his piece from the, the, uh, the Book of Mormon uh, manuscript and then they and it's actually included in this particular volume. And they even uh, 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 say this is the Ashworth piece or whatever. So we're not, you're not, we're not saying you have to give this to, to physically give that. You could just give it, loan it to them to take a picture of it, and then you have it back in your collection. So that's kind of how that works as well. So when we're saying contributing, we're not saying you have to physically give it to them, but we just they want to get the best possible high resolution images of these documents. And uh, and so, so so that we can tell the complete story. Uh, of this of this dynamic history of this wonderful story um, that I just think is a real privilege for me to be able to be part of this telling the story so that lay people can kind of get a get a better hold of the history of the church as well and all these things now now so the last volume comes out and I have to ask each one of you what's next for you what are you going to be working on Uh, well, as you can imagine, there's there's uh, n there's a plen there's plenty of records for us to publish here at the Church History Library. Um, we are uh, all kind of doing many different things. Uh, I myself am working on the William Clayton journals. Um, William Clayton was an early member of the church. He lived in Nauvoo. He was a close associate of Joseph Smith and and other leaders of the church. And he kept this incredible journal that. Uh, has not been made available. Uh, and so I I am working with a wonderful team putting that volume together. And uh, yeah, it's a real treat to work on that. Um, I'm also working on a, a few other projects, um, but yeah, we're, we're they're keeping us busy. There's um, there's lots to do, L lots of church history to, to publish. Eric? What's really cool, I don't know if we totally knew that this was happening, but by now we've kind of created what you might call a documentary editing program, if you will, because um, so at first it, um, there were so many of us working on the Joe Smith papers, but then people get the idea, oh, let's let's turn those same uh, documentary editing talents toward publishing other things. So I was able to be involved in, uh, I can't remember when it came out, 2015 or 2016, first 50 years of Relief Society. This was selected documents about the, the Relief Society, uh, which is the church's women's organization. And 
because I had learned so much about documentary editing, working with Robin and Cheryl and other geniuses on the Joe Smith papers, I was able to apply those skills and uh, an approach to the first few years. So now, besides that, we we published all of the uh, diaries of Emmeline Wells. She was a uh, one of the general presidents of the Relief Society in the uh, early uh, 1900s. She has 47 diaries, just massive set of diaries. Um, I've been able to support the Eliza Snow Sermons Project, which is a web and print project. Sherilyn has worked on that. Um, that's another document editing project. I've been able to support the journals of George Q. Cannon and George F. Richards, which are these massive uh, journals of uh, uh, members of the Quorum of the Twelve. And so it uh, uh, it seems like, for one thing, um, working on the Joseph Smith papers, we all acquired this talent to know how to do documentary editing. And it seems like an audience for it has kind of been created. It's it's people are interested in this stuff like you're talking about. They're like, well, what does what did uh, you know? I know what George Q. Cannon said about that that meeting, but Emmeline Wells was there too. What did she say about it? And we can make those records available. And it seems like a really good way of publishing the uh, records of the of the church. It seems like something that the church leaders are are really comfortable with. We put the records out there. People we. Pe the church itself can use those in curriculum. You know, if, if if the curriculum people need a quotation about, you know, some gospel topic, like what did somebody believe believe about Jesus Christ or what did a church leader say about the Book of Mormon, they can use that. But then scholars can use it too for for all kinds of all kinds of their work. So it's really exciting to have been part of part of this evolving kind of documentary editing program. Cool. Sherilyn? So I will be working on a handwriting ID for the remainder of the remaining Joseph Smith documents, um, which includes some legal documents and financial record books. When I say financial record books, we're looking at 200, 300 page uh, volumes. These are significant <laughs> pieces. Um, I'm also, as Eric mentioned, I'm working, I'm a volume editor uh, for the discourses of Eliza R. Snow. Eliza R. Snow was one of the original members of the Nauvoo Relief Society. And uh, when she uh, comes west, uh, Brigham Young authorizes her to reorganize the relief societies in the various settlements in the Utah Territory and in some settlements in Idaho. And so this discourse volume is a, an effort to represent some of her teachings to these uh, Latter-day Saint women, as well as teachings to the young ladies organizations and primary organizations that she played a role in their organization as well. But she um, is really quite a remarkable figure in that in her discourses, she, she um, relays some of the teachings of Joseph Smith regarding uh, women and priesthood, as well as her, her perceptions on various theological aspects of the church. And um, she's really a formative figure in, in the development of uh, the organizations uh, church organizations in uh, territorial Utah. That uh, volume, which at this point is probably slated to have about 75, 80 discourses in it, uh, will be published in 2026. The, um, the exhaustive representation of those discourses is available on the Church Historians Press web website currently. So I have a quick question for you all. This, this is the Church Historians Press. This is the Joseph Smith Papers Project. What is going to be the next? Have we even talked about what is going to be the next project? Have you is there even even speculation on this, or have you guys had conversations about what is the next big thing that you guys want to do? Because now that you've done it, you know you can do it. I imagine you'd probably want to continue with this, especially how great greatly successful this whole series has been. Anything? I, <laughs> I I've told people that um, we're moving from. A really big project with a lot of people working on it to a lot of smaller projects. Um, okay. I, I, there's not going to be any one big project. Uh, some people have wanted us to do the Brigham Young papers or, yeah. you know, someone else. Um, the problem with that is that doing the the Brigham Young papers the same as if we did the Joseph Smith papers, that would, you know, it took us 20 plus years to work on the Joseph Smith papers. It would have taken us 100 years to do the Brigham Young papers. There, there's many, many times over more papers with Brigham Young than there is with Joseph Smith. Um, and that that sort of resources and commitments, there's some, you know, opportunity costs. If we're if we're spending so much time on Brigham Young, what are the things we can't do? And 
and yeah, so th there's a lot of considerations, but uh, as of now, there's no plan to do uh, a significant large scale project like we have with the Joseph Smith papers. So keep an eye out, Devin Jensen, and they'll probably have some people to come on and talk about the uh, the Brigham Young uh, Journals uh, project yeah. that they're working on at BYU. They just announced that recently, and so we'll be we'll be engaging Brigham Young in his papers as well. What an exciting thing to be able to do! Um, you know, I just want to thank um, all three of you for coming on the program today. It was a real pleasure. I really I, I think that this is really important that we make Mormon history accessible to the broadest audience possible. And a lot of people, there's a lot of evangelicals that watch this channel to get uh, to uh, do research on the church. I got a lot of atheists that watch it, members, non-members. And, and this is, I think it's really important that we, that this has become um, for a, a project that's more, just more than just something for an institutions and elites, but it's, it, this is a project for the people. And what a beautiful thing that it kind of evolved into something like that. It's Amen, thank you. brother. Yeah, thank you so much for this time. It's it's always a pleasure to interact with the public and and talk about the work that we do. Yeah, we love sharing it. Okay, folks, yeah, we're going to have links in the description here for all that what we talked about, and I'll probably have Robin. Robin, send me all the links I need, the website and whatever links that I need to put in the description here. And yeah. uh, so check out all these great resources that we're going to be providing here. Um, I just, you know, folks in the comments, tell me what you think and tell me, how, do, do, are you a collector? Uh, which volumes do you have in your collection? Um, that kind of stuff. Let's let's get the conversation going. I'd love to hear from you. For those of you who uh, have been, this is my only volume, but I hope to get more. And uh, it's just an exciting thing to be able to do this engagement. So folks, just remember uh, in the description as well, there will be places where you can financially support the channel, both on PayPal as well as Patreon. Don't forget, we also have the merch store, mormonbookreviews.com, where you can get nice hot chocolate mugs and ball caps and all sorts of cool things. So check out our website. But just remember, this is the most important thing, folks, is this. Remember, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.